With the men away, women keep life back home on track. They run the farms and they keep family businesses afloat. My two older brothers had gone to the war. My mother, 16-year-old sister, 12-year-old brother and I had to run the farm. We did the work of men, reaping, cutting the corn, using three horses in the binder. We had to stack the sheaves and stooks to dry, and then the sheaves had to be thrown onto the dray. We did the milking, separating, making butter. We helped with the sowing, gathering potatoes and storing them for the winter, running a large garden. It was very hard work, but I liked the open air life. But for 15-year-old gifted student Katerina Farero Aruhe Tato, the war ruins a bright academic future. I had a hard working life, eh? My eldest brother enlisted into the war and my dad was growing wheat by the acre. Acres and acres of it. So I gave up school. I was the eldest one, you see, so I had to give up school and help dad. Deborah Pitts Taylor drives ambulances in England. The Kiwi girl is treated as one of the boys. The mere fact of my being a New Zealand girl was enough for them to take me to their clan, so to speak. They treat New Zealand girl quite differently. It's very funny. They will lie down and die for you if necessary, but you're expected to be very understanding and put up with no end of teasing, and not to expect any pretty compliments because you won't get them. You're a bit of a pal, while an English girl is a girl to be flirted with. Annie Montgomery follows her boys to war and along the way gets a taste of London life. Tuesday, 12th June, 1917. Went off to Pall Mall. Got a table quite near the one Princess Beatrice of Battenberg and her party sat at, and we had an excellent view of them all the time. She's no looker, but a lot of her party were worse. Over 900 patriotic societies spring up around the country. Women join in droves, raising money and making goods for their soldiers, European refugees and war orphans. They raised nearly £5.7 million in cash, with £500 million today, and sent more than £550,000 of goods overseas. For empire and for freedom, we all must do our bit. The men go forth to battle, the women wait and bid. But safe sex campaigner Etty Rout knows the boys need a lot more than socks and scarves. The only two permanent reliable attractions are beer and women. Mostly women. Well, if they will have beer, I say give them good beer and not in too great quantities. And if they will have women, and they most certainly will, give them clean women. We contend that we send our sons to fight for purity and righteousness and place on record our emphatic repudiation of prophylactics and the woman who advocates them. Is sexual relationship a necessity for the troops or is it not? The troops have certainly decided yes. Our duty is to make that relationship accessible and harmless. Why get into moral tangles? Moral tangles indeed. Etty is branded the wickedest woman in Britain. 1914. As fighting begins, the government refuses to send our nurses overseas. Some go anyway, paying their own way to serve with English, French and Australian nursing units. The patients come down the Somme in barges to here. Two barges always come at one time and are pulled by a tug. The journey down takes 30 hours and the patients are all cleaned and pyjama on the journey and their wounds redressed if necessary. The wounds here are terrific and many of the patients are minus both legs. Or well, sometimes the wounds are so extensive it is difficult to know how to move them to dress them. Many, many die. Throughout the war, over 550 Kiwi nurses care for their own and the enemy. They work on ships, in hospitals, in tents, and on the front lines. I feel so disgusted and ashamed to think I have to nurse the Huns. This is what I paid my fare and came 16,000 miles for. Food given is just enough to keep them alive and well. The hospital is surrounded with two rows of barbed wire and sentries on duty. It is a beautiful place and should be used for our boys. Of course, we only do dressing and just what is necessary, no more. Annie Montgomery has followed her boys to war. They survive the first year. Monday, 6th of August, 1917. 
a year to the day we arrived in England. Well, it has been a wonderful year and one none of us would have missed. I thank God that we came and have been able to keep in touch with our precious boys all the time. I shrink fearfully from the stress ahead. Louisa Higginson does not take well to some of the London ways. What seems to be shocking is the way women drink whiskey, also smoke cigarettes. I do not mind the smoking, but they make a habit of it. I tell Mary she smokes too many, does not make an impression on her. Musical performer Marie Lloyd, queen of the double entendre, knows what her audience wants. They don't pay their sixpences and shillings at a musical to hear the Salvation Army. If I was to try to sing highly moral songs, they would fire beer mugs at me head. I can't help it if people want to turn and twist me meaning. Back home, families wait for news of their own men. When the telegram arrived, we three were staying in Wanganui with my father's only brother and family. My grandmother took the train to Wanganui to break the news personally. As soon as the two young women saw grandma's face, they knew. Shattered by the loss of her younger brother, Chummy, Catherine Mansfield writes a poem in his memory. Last night, for the first time since you were dead, I walked with you, my brother, in a dream. We were at home again, beside the stream, fringed with tall berry bushes, white and red. Don't touch them, they are poisonous, I said. But your hand hovered, and I saw a beam of strange bright laughter flying round your head. And as you stooped, I saw the berries gleam. Don't you remember? We called them dead man's bread. Finally, it's over. Armistice signed. In other words, peace for the fighting has stopped. I feel I must do something, laugh, shout or cry. In a time like this, there seems to be a short distance between laughter and tears. Mm -hmm.